Hello and welcome to Safe Pasture. My name is Sherry Hammers and we are doing part three on From the Heart. Uh, basically, I'm talking about some of the highlights I got out of a sermon that I recently listened to Charles Spurgeon about remembering Lot's wife. And it, it stirred my heart to ask myself to the, to the point of, am I being persecuted? Is my heart so full of Jesus that I could actually, uh, I can actually point to being persecuted in this world? Because Jesus said, if he's in you, the world's going to hate you as they hated him. So if you haven't seen those first two videos to kind of lay the groundwork, please do so. But for now, we're going to start off with Matthew 10, and it's verse 34 through 35. Jesus said, Think not that I came to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Okay, I added verse 36 on there. So we're even in a family, even in a household, if you if all the members of the household are not on board with surrendering their lives to Jesus, then there's going to be strife. There's going to be a division, a sword dividing you into those two groups. And I don't know, that just made me think about when Jesus said he's going to divide the goats from the sheep. So I had some questions here and wrote down, does this describe you? Is there anyone in your life that is against you for your stand of faith? Can you think of people that they, they're just like, they ain't having it from you because you're one of those Christians, you're one of those Bible believers, uh, whatever they call you? Have you lost friends because of your relationship of, with Jesus? Have you lost family relationships? You know, Jesus said, whoever doesn't, uh, you know, whoever loves mother, father, all these family ties more than they love him is not worthy of him. So have you lost these people because now there's, they, they don't agree or it doesn't line up with their religious stance or whatever? Um, here's one. Do people around you, such as co-workers, neighbors, etc., do they know about your relationship with Jesus? Or do you keep that hidden? because you don't want to cause any problems. You don't want to make any waves. It, uh, okay, has this ever happened to you? Do you have people apologizing for letting a swear word slip out because they remember that you're a Christian? That actually happened to me just today. One of my neighbors called something, um, something about where we get our mail, and he had a question, and um, he let a swear word slip out, and then he corrected it, and he put in a better word. And... I don't know. To me, that's kind of a, it's a good little checkup. It's a good little compliment that God's like, okay, he knows. Um, or do people just let the curse words fly because they don't even know you're a Christian. You've kept your salvation a secret. I mean, these are kind of hard things to think about, but you know, we are supposed to be the aroma uh, of Christ to others that are in Christ but it says to, the, to those that are in the world, we are like the scent of death because it brings conviction on them. I just want to know, like, that's a really good way, a really good thing to think about. Like, the people around you, do they really know where you're at with God? Or do you just, you know, as, as the, the little song we've all learned, you know, do you hide your light under a bushel because you just don't want to rock the boat? You don't want to make waves. Okay, so here's some other questions to th think about. Are you a Christian? Do you consider yourself a Christian because you you grew up in a Christian family or uh, your friend group right now is a bunch of Christians, so you just kind of kind of give them that vibe that you're a Christian? Is that, is that the extent of your Christianity? Because these are some of the things, some some of these questions are inspired by some of the things I heard Spurgeon say, especially this next one. Do you creep along very slowly, like in your in your walk with God? Are you less earnest than ever? Like, are you losing your 
enthusiasm and your joy about being a Christian, your excitement? Have you lagged behind in your pursuit of God? You know, Spurgeon was talking about how Lot's wife was kind of lagging behind when they were leaving Sodom. She was, she was really being torn away. She didn't want to leave. Um, another thing, do you read the Bible a little and you're still content? You're like, meh, got my little Bible reading done, did my little devotional, I'm good. Are you content with that? Do you pray a little or have just the appearance of praying? Do you, do you posture for other people? Do you not see the good? This is, this is Spurgeon's words. Do you not see the good of fury over religion and having a sacred violence in prayer? You know, are you praying these little soft prayers? Or are you, you know, are you afraid to even pray in front of other people? And I'm not condemning you if you are. I'm just saying that might be something to look at. Like, why? Why? If you could, would you be as worldly as anyone in the world? Like if, if, if there was no consequences, no consequences, like you held the belief like is so popular these days that, oh, everybody's going to go to heaven. God's not mad at anybody. He's, he's, he's fine. He's good. He's, he loves everybody unconditionally and he's all good. If you could, would you be as worldly as anyone else in the world? Ooh. Do you prove your true character? This is what Spurgeon said. Do you prove your true character by slackening your pace? So are you just kind of plugging along, dragging your feet in the Christian area? And, and then when you're out in the world, it's, you know, you're all excited. Um, I thought this was interesting. Do you disbelieve what the Bible says will happen? And, okay, so what does that mean? So do you believe that if you sin, do you believe that if you go against God, that there's truly consequences for that? Especially the problem, the problem for a lot of people is, is that God doesn't smack them down right away. Like there's no immediate consequence for mo most of the time. You know, there's no immediate consequence if I plant weed seeds in my garden either. You won't see anything for a while. But when it comes up, everybody will know. It'll be plain. So do you disbelieve this? I mean, if, if we're walking around like kind of half believing that God says there's going to be a judgment day, that God says that we need to, that we, we do need to obey God, that there's not this greasy grace that's just, God's just going to wink at sin and everything's okay because you walked an aisle one day and said a prayer and you think you're on your way to heaven. I mean, we need to be getting into this Bible. If we believe that it's true, if we believe that God spoke the truth, I was just speaking to a complete stranger I ran into the other day. We were in, and I was witnessing to her for just a few minutes. It's all I had. And that's all she had. But I said, you know, my thing is if the Bible doesn't apply to our lives, then why would God have, made sure that this thing was preserved through the ages why would God have written it to begin with if he didn't want us to follow it if he didn't want us to obey what he said if Jesus dying on the cross means that nobody has to obey anymore that makes absolutely no sense like God doesn't even God is okay with sin now because Jesus, there's just craziness if we sit down and look at it but if you disbelieve that the Bible s says that it means what it says, or I, I just got distracted there for a second because I thought, but some people don't even know what the Bible says. They, they don't even crack it open. Or it, when they do, they don't really take it into their heart. It's just in their head. But if you look in the book of Revelation, you know, the first, the first, some of the first people that get tossed into the lake of fire are the people that had unbelief and fear and they were cowardly. And if you don't read the Bible, there's no way you're going to have God's courage when, and when, 
when it's time to stand, which is now. We're in it now. So, uh, gosh, I keep looking at the time because it just, I get talking about these things and the time just flies. All right, so let me, let me just, I'll try to wrap this up. I want to talk about a few more things. Do you look back at the thing God told you not to do? So you know you're not supposed to do a certain thing. God's convicted your heart. Do you keep looking back with longing like, oh, I'm, I'm obeying God, but I, gosh, I just remember how much fun that was. And, oh, it's just too bad it's against God. You know, is there some kind of longing? Like Lot's wife looked back at Sodom. Her feet were walking away, but her heart was still there. She wanted to be there. She wanted to be there. And then she died in the very act of her rebellion. We'll talk more about that in a bit. But we must live a separated life. We live in a world of Christians. This is some of the thoughts Spurgeon had. But they live like the world, like these, these so-called air quotes, you know, air quotes Christians. They, we live in a world full of these people, but a lot of them live like the world. And so he was asking these questions. Is your pleasure in the world? Is your speech like the world? Many people think, and I'm throwing this in, many people think they're separated. I talked about this earlier. But many people think they're separated. They're living a separated life unto God because they go to church. And I just want to, I thought about this earlier when I said it, but I'm going to go ahead and say it now. There's a lot of people, and I've met them, I mean, a lot of people that believe that church, like going to the organized, institutionalized church is equivalent to having a relationship with God. Like it's equivalent to having your life in a state of deliverance from sin. Like you are saved. A lot of people equate that because when people say, oh, so-and-so doesn't go to church anymore, they immediately believe that he doesn't have a relationship with God anymore. Or I've had people invite me to church, or I, actually I, I had a little study group one time, and they were eighth graders, boys and girls. And I asked them when the last time was that they witnessed to someone and one of the boys spoke up and said a couple weeks ago, and I said, oh, well, tell us about it. And he said, well, I invited this other kid to church. And I said, but when did you witness to him? And he, he kind of looked at me like, I just told you, I invited him to church. Inviting people to church is not the same as witnessing to them. Because when you witness to somebody, you're asking them to look at the state of their heart and see if they need to repent and surrender their lives to God. But anyway, that's not the topic of this video. It's related, but on the in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead. I better see how much more I've got here. Okay, I, I can probably squeeze this in. Okay, so Spurgeon, this is direct quote from Spurgeon. They are of the world. He's talking about these ungodly Christians, so-called Christians that say they're Christians. And this is what he says. And because they are of the world, the world loves its own. And therefore, there's no strife between them and the world. Only let us live as Christ lived, and we shall find the dogs of this world howling at us as they used to do at our forefathers. And I just want to insert this. When I was talking about in the first video about am I persecuted? Because if we're not persecuted then we better make sure we are in the faith. Because like he just said, only let us live as Christ lived. You know, Jesus walked around and, and he had disciples and everything that were, well, there was, there was one that was not good, but for the most part, they were for him. But he had strife everywhere. He had religious leaders. He had, I mean, he had people that were, were in strife with him because they kept challenging his words when he would talk the truth about God. And so Spurgeon's saying, we're going to have dogs howling at us, you know, nipping at our heels, trying to get a piece out of us if we're speaking the truth. 
so let me continue. He says, my hearers, can you live the separated life? If you can, God help you and bless you in it. But if you cannot, recollect though you do not so go into Sodom as to indulge in its grossest sins, yet the very looking at it, the wishing for it, the desiring to be there shows where your heart is. And your heart's tendency is your true character. You will be judged according to the going of your heart. If your heart goes toward the mountain to escape, and if you hasten to be away with Christ, to be his separated follower, you shall be saved. But if your heart still goes after evil and sin, his servants ye are whom ye obey. And from your evil master, you shall get your black reward. So he didn't pull any punches. He said, you're either, you're either going with, you're either going with Christ or you're going away from him and there'll be reward accordingly. He said, Lot's wife, uh, this is just thoughts I put down from what he said, but her doom was horrible. She perished with the same doom as what happened to the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so here again, I quoted Spurgeon because I, you just can't improve on this. He says, Oh, if I must be damned, let it be with the mass of the ungodly, having always been one of them. But to get up to the very gates of heaven and to perish there would be a most awful thing. To have lived with God's people, to have been numbered with them, to have been joined to them by ties of blood, and then after all to perish. That would be horrible indeed. To have heard the gospel, to have felt the gospel too in a measure, to have amended one's life because of it to have escaped from the filthiest corruption of the world and to have become moral and amiable and excellent and yet not to have been weaned from the world, not to have been clean, divorced from sin and so to perish. The thought is intolerable. And again, he says, on the verge of mercy to be slain by justice, on the brink of salvation, to be the victim of eternal wrath. Remember Lot's wife. Her doom came suddenly. What if sudden death should strike some of you down at this moment? You professors. He's talking about you profess faith, not professors in a college. But you, you professors who still love the world. What if you now fell dead? You professed Christians who sneak in among the ungodly to have a suck at their pleasures. And then I added this at the end. What if you were struck dead? He said, she perished in the very act of sin and had no space for repentance given her. It is a dreadful thing to die in the very act of sin, to be caught away by the justice of God while the transgression is being perpetrated. Yet such a thing may happen. Let those who profess to be Christians and yet parley with sin, remember Lot's wife. And how swift God is to deal out his judgment against professors who betray his holy name and cause. Look to yourselves, lest ye lead others astray. Keep near to God, and you will be blessed and be a blessing to others. Beautiful words from Spurgeon, very um, hard-hitting, convicting I, I was I, the one part here that just got me when he said, but to get to the very gates of heaven and to perish there. I mean, there's so many people that are deceived thinking once saved, always saved. All you got to do is look at the Israelites in the wilderness and know that's not true. God expects you to go to the end. What did Jesus say? We talked about this a few days ago, but let me get back to. He says, you, okay, he says, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Matthew 10, 22. You can't just start out. You got to finish this. You got to, you got to endure to the end. That's what he said. You have to stay faithful to him. He's faithful to you. But anyway, I hope this has been thought provoking. And um, every, you know, every one of us needs to take stock of our heart. We need to see 
where are we at? Because like I said in a previous video, it's really easy to just kind of drift away. You know, it happens so subtly. And the devil knows that. He knows that all he has to do is distract you just get, and just ease you out of this fire for God and just kind of cool everything down. And he, it's like he lulls you to sleep. And before you know it, you're completely out. But we don't want to do that. We don't want to be like the little coal, you know, in the fire that rolls away. And yeah, it's warm for a little while. And then the temperature keeps going down, down, down. And pretty soon there's no heat anymore. It's out. And Paul says we're supposed to stir up the flame that's in us. And all, all I'm doing, I, I'm just delivering you the what comes a lot of times out of the um, overflow of my time with God. And this came so clearly to me the other day that I needed to put this material together because there's someone that is listening to this that knows that you need to get it right with God. You need to get out of the world. God is bringing judgment on the world. And if you're still in it, if your heart is still there, you'll get the same punishment. I mean, Lot's wife, her heart was still there. And if we don't get out, that's why God had prophets. He would say, these prophets would tell the people, hey, God's saying this, this is urgent, here's a warning. And I'm telling you, God told me to put this together and, and I even kind of rushed through it because it was just so recent. I usually like to mull things over a little longer and kind of tweak it here and there. But I just really felt the urgency that somebody out there needs to hear this today. And I, I'll just put this little reminder too. I mean, it's, I know it's, you've heard this before, but it's, it's worth it to be reminded that none of us are promised tomorrow. None of us. We, we're not even promised the next five minutes. We, we have no control over our next heartbeat being there, our next breath being there. So that's why the Bible says, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Because you're not promised tomorrow. And you don't, you know, if you, if you believe the Holy Spirit's dealing with you, and you don't have to have, you know, um, as I heard one man say one time, you know, God, if this is you, you know, have two dogs walk this way and three cats walk the other way. No, no. If you're even thinking possibly the Holy Spirit is talking to you, don't wait for confirmation. Don't wait for that. If you know he's dealing with your heart right now that you have sin in your heart, then you just go ahead and you repent. You tell him that you're sorry and you get your relationship with God back on track. There's nothing more important than that. Nothing. Your eternity is at stake. So I hope you've enjoyed this little mini-series. And thank you again for joining me. God bless.